Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest this week is founder and senior acoustic consultant of the innovative smart studio, Jim Dunn. But first of all, I don't know if you heard, but Billboard has some new charts. Yeah, they have a weekly top songwriters chart and a weekly top producers chart. So you might be thinking, how are they determining who's a top songwriter and who's a top producer? Well, it's actually based on the total number of points that they attribute to songs on other charts. So in other words, if you produce a song that's on five different charts or you produce five different songs that are on one chart, doesn't matter. It's the number of contributions that you have and they have a point system and that's what puts you on the chart. Same with songwriters. Now, the very first week, guess who's on top of both charts? Well, Phineas O'Connell and Billie Eilish. Of course, Phineas is Billie's brother, who's also her producer. Billie Eilish is probably one of the hottest acts, if not the hottest act in the business right now. And it would figure that they would top each chart. So there's a lot of people that are looking at this skeptically, thinking, why do we need this? It turns out that Billboard is having a lot of pushback on its charts recently. And people are saying, well, wait a second, we have charts on just about every streaming service. Why do we need billboard charts? They're kind of irrelevant anymore. You know what they were, especially when they're based on sales? They're no longer based on sales, although that's a component. It's based on a lot of different things, on a social component, on the amount of streaming, on YouTube views. So the charts, especially the major ones, the Hot 100, try to take all of that an artist's total musical presence into consideration. Billboard, to give them credit, has been really trying to stay relevant and really trying to make their charts relevant. Now, of course, the history of Billboard is the fact that it goes back to the days way before music when it was mostly about circus entertainment and vaudeville and things like that where we're looking at the box office for these things. And it was mostly for the wholesale business. So it's the people that advertised with these. And then, of course, then it was mostly for record labels in the days of sales, vinyl sales and CD sales, trying to get record labels to advertise to retailers telling them how cool they were and how cool the new artists are and how well the new release was doing. It's all irrelevant now because it doesn't work like that anymore. And now what's happening is it's become more of a outward facing, more of a retail magazine. So it's not so much for the industry, it's more for everybody else. Even though the industry, especially record labels, seem to place chart position way, way higher than maybe they should. It's almost like a contest within record labels of who has the most artists on the charts and who has the highest positions. When it seems like the only people that really care about this are people that work for record labels, in many cases the artists, especially if they're major artists. So anyway, you might be interested in these two new charts, top songwriters and top producers. If not, I don't blame you. Just go and look at the Apple Music charts, the Spotify charts, the Tidal charts and you might get as much information as you need. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Don't forget about my online courses on mixing, production, branding, and music business success at bobbyosinskicourses.com. Also, get an expert analysis and objective opinion of your songs and mixes as a member of my Hitmakers Club. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. Now, here's an interesting news item. The Australian version of Homeland Security intercepted a whole bunch of speakers, Nexo speakers, which are sound reinforcement, that were packed with drugs. Almost two tons of drugs that were worth about $835 million. It was all meth, a little bit of heroin. These were fake PS15 R2 speakers that are basically a just a small 15-inch speaker with a horn packed with drugs. <laughs> no speaker components, just drugs. 
it turns out that these weren't true Nexo speakers. If you're not into sound reinforcement, you might not be familiar at Nexo, but Nexo is a fairly large speaker manufacturer. They were bought by Yamaha a number of years ago. They're French originally, but highly regarded. One of the problems is the fact that all of a sudden, Nexo speakers and Yamaha speakers and Sennheiser, JBL, Shure, all of those companies are having their gear cloned in Mpeg City in China. Yeah, there's a couple of companies there that specialize in doing counterfeit speakers and microphones. For some reason, they don't do studio gear, I guess because there's not enough of it sold, so they concentrate more on sound reinforcement stuff and Nexo is one of them. It turns out that these might have been Chinese knockoffs, but the shipment with all the drugs originated in Bangkok. This isn't the only one, though. In fact, not that long ago, there was 1.9 tons of meth and heroin that was captured at the port of Los Angeles on its way to Australia. And these were in fake Alpha Sonic enclosures. Once again, another speaker manufacturer that does sound reinforcement speakers. Now, again, it's funny because I would think they would use the big line array boxes. And in fact, they're not. They're using the like single 15 with the horn box, which is big enough, but not that big. And I guess they figure there's plenty more of those. Usually the cost of a real speaker goes in the neighborhood of $2,200 or so. So it's not that expensive. I guess they figured that they wouldn't get Homeland Security or Customs looking at these. But in fact, now they have on two different continents. You know, it's funny because I can think way back into the 70s when I was playing in a band and we were carrying our pot around when it was way, way illegal and <laughs> it wasn't much, believe me, but we would put it in our voice of the theater cabinets, the Altec voice of the theaters, because there's lots of room in there and that would elude the police. And of course, they didn't have the sophisticated methods of looking for it like they have these days, but it worked then, it doesn't work now. Jim Dunn has over 30 years experience in the acoustics and noise control industry and has worked in a number of different roles in related industries. His previous work experience ranges from on-site construction activities to recording studio design and build to electroacoustic equipment supply and install to company management. Jim also worked for a number of years in the world-famous Windmill Lane Studios, one of the premier recording facilities in Ireland, which catered to clients like U2, The Waterboys, and Kate Bush. In his role as a senior acoustic consultant at Smart Studio, Jim marries his theoretical knowledge with his practical experience in order to implement this very cool new way of studio building. In the interview, we talked about the technical aspects of Smart Studio, the typical build time, what a deconstruction is like, speaker calibration, and much more. I spoke with Jim via Skype from the Smart Studio offices in Dublin. First of all, talk about Smart Studio. Okay. Okay. Smart Studio is a bit. It's a response to. Um, it's a response to what I found in the industry in regards to uh, the quality of what of so-called studios, uh, rooms that people call studios, and in finding that they're very disappointing, and also see, thinking that people should know better than they seem to know. But you know, life life is life is what life is as such. So. It's one element is 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 endeavouring to, to you know let's let's without being too to, without being too socialist or what have you but the idea is that you know anybody can have a high quality studio years ago it was to some degree it was based around these high profile high profile acousticians and they're you know and they did an excellent job and what have you and they, but it, it was all quite uh, um, difficult to achieve in terms of pricing. So, uh, in, you know, all that process is, is quite an expensive process. So that was one side of it. And then the other side of it was that um, we seen ourselves working on a couple of projects where we had done the acoustic design and we're absolutely disappointed with the final outcome. And to the point where we question our own acoustic design and what have you. And we couldn't identify any obvious flaws. Um, so part of it is that, especially in the modern construction industry, the people who are building these studios are not people who build studios for a living, okay? 
they tend to be a main contractor and in a certain area of the building there's going to be a studio and then it's all worked out based upon a, a program and a package and lots of people there's a design done and then there's lots of people brought in this the, the pack the, the studio design is broken up and you do this bit and you do that bit and you do that bit and there's a project manager and there's lots of you know corporate entities around the place running it but the reality is nobody on the team knows what a studio should look like and more importantly what it should sound like as such so therefore modern construction techniques are do um are not conducive to building good studios, number one. And the guys, while everybody's working to their best endeavors and, and nobody denies or doubts that, um, if you don't exactly know what you're building, it's very hard to know if it's right or wrong as such. So therefore, we wanted to take control of that particular, of the complete project. And again, I suppose it's one of these things, We, um, my, you know, Smart Studio is a reflection of my working uh, uh, life and my uh, various uh, educational uh, qualifications uh, and experiences. And one of them which has been really instrumental in, in the Smart Studio thing has been the fact that I worked with my dad in a construction industry a long time ago. Worked with him a long time ago and I ran out of it saying, I don't want to know anything about this construction industry and what have you. Went off to do the electronic engineering, worked in the recording studio, set up my own business selling the equipment, uh, then went to college and actually qualified uh, later in life in, in, the, in the area of acoustics. But you know what? The one skill that has been core to developing Smart Studio and to be the acoustics business was the experience I gained in the construction industry. It's it's quite, an, it's, 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 but there you go. It meant that I'm not afraid of building sites. And I don't mean that in a, that's probably a, a rather exaggerated phrase, but they don't phase me. Whereas, you know, I've been on building sites. I've seen how things go together. Uh, I've seen what you can do, what you can't do. And I've seen how you kind of, you know, you manage certain things as such. And that's been really key in the sense of taking on Smart Studio and you know, the fact that you know we have a CNC machine just in, in the in the in the warehouse behind me here. We're the only acoustics company in the world, I would think, with a CNC machine. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, we took it on. We said, look at you know, we we're going to do this here. We're going to have to make these things, and we had to buy the CNC machine, and we had to learn how to use it. But the great thing now is, if we come up with an alternative design, or we come up with a new idea, well, you know what? It's only one sheet of plywood that might get wasted. So you know, it, there's a lot of return for that effort and energy, and that and that you know that that. Uh, um, Effort, effort to do to learn all these skills because now it gives us capabilities way above and beyond uh, um, you know what will be available it, all the capabilities are available but they're all in a small cellular packages we actually pull them together into one integrated package well let's talk about that for a second but first of all something that you you said resonated with me here about the construction people not being aware of what they're building and it's certainly true. One of the things in Southern California, though, for a time, there were so many studios being built that there were actually dedicated companies that were really good at it. But this was kind of back in the heydays of the 80s and 90s. And, you know, there's not as many studios. Yeah, it's certainly the case, I know, where, you know, you, you'll have all these contractors and they're not all sure what to do. And it's important because if they don't do it right then in fact you're going to have deterioration in, in the isolation or you know the, the the acoustics of the room yeah indeed and and it's the de acoustics is all about detail and it's not the 99 percent you, you get right it's the one percent you get wrong is the problem you know um and and we have a little in-house joke here we sort of we our little joke is that uh, um uh, no no builders have been hurt in the construction of this studio <laughs> <laughs> jim who are your clients Okay, our clients are actually, be, uh, are, uh, initially we certainly designed it for the sound for pictures people because the guys doing dubbing, doing uh, revoicing, doing ADR, doing, you know, sound for pictures because the reality was those guys still have a budget because in the world of video, um, if, if a 10% a budget for audio is very generous uh, uh, and so therefore, and they've also got a franchise in, in the sense that they have got programs to get on air, they've got slots to fill, they've got advertisements sold. So therefore, there's a there's a, a valid business model there, which which is which is active all over the world. It's active all over the world. Um, 
we found with the music boys that since they can't sell you a CD anymore, they've, they've lost their business model and what have you. But funny enough now, we find ourselves working with some some studio people, uh, audio studio people, music studio people as such, you know, which is a great surprise and, and a great joy in its own right. But it was very much initially designed for... I suppose the marketplace we're looking at from an Irish point of view is the UK marketplace in the Soho area where you've got a lot. It, it's it's a hub for media activity. It is all the major record companies there. All the major film companies are there. All the people who supply services to those companies are all in that area. And when you looked at the, at the likes of the Soho marketplace, it's a very, or the Soho geography, it's a very small, uh, uh, narrow roads, very narrow laneways. And when you get into the building, it's very hard to get materials up and down the building. So that's what made me think about modular. And that's what made me think about uh, the idea of making it sort of bite-sized pieces, which will make it easier to get the materials in. And number two, actually give you the option to get them back out again, because one of the, 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 the great side, side uh, benefits of Smart Studio is that you can actually take it with you. Mm. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, it's it's very important. I mean, it it, it feeds into it, it feeds into the investment decision making process. You know, what residual value do we have from our investment? Uh, and it also feeds into the into the environmental world as well, too, in the sense that things don't have to be trashed. You know, uh, you know, you, it's got a it's got a value uh, uh, above and beyond just its first initial install, as far as it goes. So, therefore, they're all important features. Especially the environmental one has become a much more prominent and much more high profile in in the modern world we're living in as such you know so so the time for pictures people were the kind of guys and again what you find with them again having worked in that business i know what happens is that deadlines get uh, you know st- target dates are set but people don't make decisions until very very late in the day and then they really want a quick deployment so therefore the smart studio um, we're the only people in the world in the studio game who can say to you well we probably got half of your studio in stock <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, because uh, if we're not out building, uh, installing studios, we're, we're just making the components here. They don't have a shelf life. They don't have an upgrade situation. They're they're passive as far as it goes. And, you know, so so we're, we're you know, uh, day zero or day one on site is not day one of the project from our point of view. It's day one on site. But there's been day minus X in, 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 in pre- preceding that, whereby we were able to to, to, you know, make the components. And then they, that's the beauty of the design is that it's very robust. It's, we use the same modular uh, system, you know, on all jobs. Uh, and, and even to the point whereby somebody said, well, could you not make a smart studio light? And I said, well, we could, but you know, all we're going to do is save uh, maybe six or seven inches on a side panel of a, of a module. And, you know, that doesn't contribute any real saving, yet it would really imp- impede and, and in, uh, the, the performance of the room. So we kind of have something that is just there. Yeah. And it works. Um, and and uh, um, we can make it. I suppose the first thing we can say about it is Smart Studio works acoustically. Number two, we can make it. Number three, we can install it. And number four, we're, up, we're on the sales push now. But being, being the person I am, I wasn't going to push on the sales until such point in time as I was sure about one, two, and three. And in that order, number one, it works acoustically. Number two, we can make it. And then number three, we can install it. I don't know if you can see behind me, but the tube traps. Yep. I see them there. Yep. I've had these for maybe 20 years, but I bought them just for the reason you're talking about, because I knew they were portable and I could take the acoustics with me wherever I went. So they're not the most efficient passive devices I've, or acoustic devices I've ever seen, but on the other hand, they do the job. They do, and they're portable indeed. Yes, exactly. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yes. That being said, let's talk about, you say it's modular. I assume that there are wall modules and you have corner modules that would make all this work. Are the bass traps built into these modules or are they separate? No, the, the whole idea behind it is the module is a multi a multi dimensional acoustic entity as such. Uh, the back of it, it's first of all it's a frame that stands up on the floor independently. Number two, it is the back of the module has a lot of uh, high density um, gypsum board. You'd call it um, dry lining, or you call it rock rock sheet rock sheet rock. Yes. Yeah, and we would also have other components in there, such as dead sheet, which is basically a limp mass material. So we make up a the back of the module is a is a very um, high density sound insulation element. 
The middle of the module is basically an acoustic chamber. And then the front of the module is where we have a choice between what we call 2D diffusion or base absorption. So therefore, that is what the module is. Now, the 2D diffusion is something we use a lot of um, because our objective is to never to, is, is, is to uh, retain some of the acoustic energy in the room. Mm. It's so easy to absorb the mid-high frequencies and end up with an unbalanced and over-pronounced low-frequency component. And that's the easiest thing in the world to do, and it happens regularly, it does. So what we try and do is actually retain the acoustic energy in the room, and that's why we use diffusion. Now, it's, it's a light diffusion. It's not quadratic diffusion, which is very... Uh, particular and you, you've got to be very careful about where you use quadratic diffusion. Now, I would probably use quadratic diffusion in a, in a studio environment because it'll, it'll allow me to tailor and play around with sounds. But when you're in the control room where you need to hear accurately the actual sound from the speakers, you need to be very careful about quadratic diffusers and, and using them as such. So we use 2D diffusion and that helps us retain the acoustic energy in the room, but we still achieve a very comfortable low frequency response. So therefore, what's happening is the people working in the room are are um, they're not ex they don't become fatigued. You know what in a room that makes you tired is a lot of low, a lot of high frequency absorption, and you're okay. And first thing in the morning, and the next thing you know, you're working your way through the daytime. In the mid afternoon, you're a little bit sort of uh, you're a little bit fatigued. You keep on working because the nature of this business is you got to get the job done. You finish maybe seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. You come in in the morning and you're horrified to hear how the mix sounds as you went further to the day. <coughs> What's been happening there is your ears have been subject to what we call temporary threshold shift. Hearing being a dynamic uh, organ, it actually shifts to try and compensate for, for uh, lack of information. So what happens is that your hearing shifts slightly you're mixing to that new um, calibration that your earring has taken on, and it's not accurate. And when you come back in the morning with fresh ears, it sounds very, very, it sounds very, it sounds it doesn't sound like what you thought it would sound like as such. Yeah. So therefore, you end up in a scenario where you possibly have to remix maybe an hour's worth of material and what have you. So it's not the place to be from anybody's point of view. It's not a good place to find that your t hearing is, is your hearing uh, thresholds are shifting from another point of view. And um, the diffusion... Also, from a third point of view as well, too, we, by keeping the energy in the room and not absorbing it, what you find is you don't have to turn the volume dial up as much on the mixing desk. Mm -hmm. Now, that has, again, going back to my electronic engineering days, that means you're not running all the gear as hot. It's running more in its linear zone because electronic equipment has got sort of, you know, three zones. It's it's not it, it, at low level. It's not linear. There's a mid area where it's very linear and at high level, it's not linear again. So you really want to keep it in this in this linear area in the middle. So therefore, by not having to turn the volume up, it's operating in its intended operational zone. It's not getting overheated. You're not going to get premature aging on the voice coils. You're not going to get the amplifiers, you know, maybe being again getting premature aging as such. So, so the whole idea of using diffusion is is a, a there's lots of really good reasons for, for it. And our 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 philosophy is simple. Our rooms don't have a sound. The only sound you hear in in our room is the sound of the speakers. You spent your time, effort, and and money and money in auditioning. So we want to make sure you hear your speakers in an environment that is neutral uh, and unobtrusive is, is what it is as such, you know. So that's kind of our philosophy behind the acoustic, the, the room acoustic element. So we use a lot of low frequency base energy trapping, and that's built in as part of the wall module. So we have base trapping on all five sides. The only place we don't have base trapping is on the floor. Mm. Because even the diffusion panels that we use, they are panels. So at low frequency, actually, actually act as panel resonators. So again, we're trying to use multiple features in in the system. Or you know, the, the diffuser, the, the front panel, the diffuser panel is a diffuser of one level. It's a low frequency absorber at another level as such. The the base frequency absorber is actually uh, is just tuned down to about sixty three hertz. Like our, our rooms will give you a consistent. 0.25 to 0.3 of a reverb time at 63 hertz. Even the small rooms, even the rooms, even the VO boots um, don't resonate. You walk into a VO boot, and we've had some really 
compromise sizes, i.e. I think 1.2 wide by 1.8 long. I mean, I would adore making up one wall and a quite <laughs> a large piece of glass on another wall. Yeah. And the room still doesn't resonate as such, you know? Wow. So the whole idea is about a very robust and a very stable design that is scalable from the small VO boot all the way up to the larger rooms. Now, there is a limit to how large we can go with our rooms. We're not, we are not going to be building the big, big dubbing theatres because that's not our game. And we recognize that that's not the marketplace we're designing for. Um, that's a conventional build. That's kind of, you know, that is your, your contractor on board with a, an acoustician basically living on his shoulder, making sure he is doing it right for the duration of the project as such, you know. Yeah. But again, the design we have, the one the one real uh, uh, um, uh, fallout from it is that the rooms have a very consistent sound. You can walk into one of the, in fact, we got a, we got a, there's a, a building in Manchester called uh, the White Tower. And on the seventh floor, we got two, we've got two quite decent sized dubbing rooms and a VO booth. And on the floor below, the sixth, sixth floor, we have a smaller uh, um, mixing room. And I have the greatest joy in life is bringing people into those rooms and walking them in. And I say nothing. They just listen without any even program playing back. They listen just, they know in their own ears the sound in the room. So I bring them all the way around the two rooms up on the seventh floor, and then I walk them down to the room on the sixth floor. And there's a consistency in the sound temperature, the sound quality. You're not finding, oh, gosh, this sounds like this, and that sounds like that. And our rooms are con are consistent, and that's a big advantage, especially for the multi-room facilities where they start a session in room A, and then they got the room C for dubbing, and then they come back to wherever for mixing. Uh, a really interesting story. We did the BVE show in London there back in the end of February. We were speaking to one of the major manufacturers of speakers. And he was telling me that um, he has to be very careful when he goes around some of the rooms in his patch in the London area because the sound in, in the one facility, room to room, is just so varied. So much so that he actually has to detune the good rooms so the bad rooms don't sound so bad. Oof. I, that to me was, oh my gosh. Yeah, right. Oh. That's just just not right. Tell me about the isolation, Jim. Okay, isolation is a, 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 a multiple, there's multiple functions feeding into isolation. One is all our rooms are built in isolated in floating floors. Mm -hmm. So that gets us off, off the uh, structural floor onto an isolated base. The walls are then constructed off that uh, on around the perimeter of that isolated floor, and the the, the ceiling stroke roof actually fits on sits on the wall. So therefore, we, none of our room it's all room within a room, which is a classic way of of, of achieving isolation. Okay, then. So now, then what we do is we always have a minimum of two hundred millimeters between the back of our module and the next adjacent structure, the next wall, or it could be a wall or it could be a ceiling. Now, in some situations, that may be a block wall, uh, a concrete block wall. Other situations, it may be uh, into an open space. So then what we do there is we then actually would use a, a very high uh, density, a uh, high rated sound insulation wall buildup from your, you know, which would be recognizable to the, to the, to the guys who are doing the sort of the, 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 the gypsum buildup systems, except we would use dead sheet in that to give us the low frequency extra performance. Now, when you're looking at high levels of sound insulation from room to room, you're, it's the same business for us as it is for everybody else. You've got two options. One, you put maybe a block wall in the middle from mass, not necessary at all for the sound for pictures boys. Absolutely not. Their mix, their mix level is, uh, is at 80 decibels at the mixed position. Uh, so then, you know, that's what they're working to. Yeah. Um, or you ha you increase the, the void between the back of our module and the next wall. And then you fill in that with a very high density rock wall, i.e. 120, 180 kg per cubic meter. Mm. And that's how you get your high levels of sound insulation. So in some situations, it, it is all very much site specific. In the middle of London, they don't want to know that it's going to be, a, you're, they're paying X number of, of, of pounds or yeah, pounds per square meter or square foot, and then suddenly find a lot of that's lost in walls, you know, voids between walls. Yeah. Uh, in a large warehouse situation where you've got loads of room, hey, it doesn't matter. If the void is, is maybe one a meter, so be it. Again, there's a, we know from our calculations, from our experience, that around about half a meter is optimum between the back of one module and the back of the next module. Going beyond that, 
the gains are fairly nominal. They're fairly, you know, they're, they're, they're not significant as such, you know. So that's that's how we do sound installation. We, and, you know, we do all those calculations and we also obviously speak to our clients and find out what their t- intended program content is going to be and find out what they're what they're looking for. Is there a typical room? A uh, typical room. There's, there's actually not a typical room. What we, the, the beauty of the smart studio system was that when we had it all built and working, I sat down and I actually went through. I just put in a spreadsheet and I went in basically three square meters, which would be about what? A three square meters would be about thirty square foot. Would it be a square meters? Is, is yeah. Yeah. Would it be? Um, and I just built a whole series of rooms, three square meters bigger each time. So we go from five odd square meters up to 50 in about 16 steps of additional three square meters. So there's nothing typical. It can be any one of those sizes. Um, You know, it's all based around, you know, one extra module here, one extra module there, right next to another module here. And it all just sort of scales up nice and, and, and simply. Now, we don't have to stick to the exact dimensions of the modules. We also have the the, the function uh, or the capabilities to, to reduce the size of a module for a custom module. But you'll find any customization is at the margins. That still the core of the system is based around our one our four foot by eight foot modules. What is a typical? Well, since there's no typical room, it's hard to, to say, I guess. But what would be the build time? Okay, build time. Again, uh, part of the motivation for this for the module thing was that you know um, we didn't want to be making too many millionaires out of guys who own hotels. So we wanted to get able to get in there quickly, get the job done, and get home again. So typical build time, I suppose you're looking at probably to be nothing less than three weeks, but you'd be building. You know, I couldn't on a single room build. The maximum would be six weeks. Maximum would be six weeks on a single room build. Um, what does that include? Okay, that includes getting to site. It includes the uh, isolated floor, the walls, the ceiling. Now, depending on, you know, a lot of this is all very site specific. You, somebody may have a room which is formed on four sides by, um, by four walls and a ceiling. So therefore they say, we want to put Smart Studio in here. So therefore all we're doing is putting the Smart Studio into that space. It's actually, it's already, the space is already created as far as it goes. In other situations, you, you find yourself where you're sort of, a, okay, you've got, you're putting into a corner of a, of a space and you've got to build two more walls, one on this side and one on that side to enclose a smart studio room. So it all, it's all very site specific. And sometimes, you know, building the, the external uh, uh, envelope walls is so, something we get the local guy to use, to get his local contractor to do, because that's a very, simple enough task um, it's not that specialist there's no you know once once it's putting jip rock on jip rock putting up a frame that's not going to be a, a huge issue as such you know and it's probably cheaper for them to do that locally so every job does have its very specific sort of um, set of circumstances that we need to review specific to that particular situation as such you know yeah okay how about hvac well, again, it's not that we want to be air conditioning engineers, but again, we know from our point of view, we have to take this on board. So there's two situations. One is we actually supply it and install it. Now, again, uh, we've got our, um, what you see behind me here is my acoustics offices, we, uh, whereby I, I've got my acoustic consultants and we work on lots of projects, um, schools, hospitals, houses, um, colleges, theaters, um, music re- recording studios on, on, a, on another sort of another level and what have you. Uh, so therefore, we, we have a lot of expertise in terms of doing acoustic assessment on acoustic assessment on uh, m and systems. So uh, we know, and again, obviously, because we know where we, we're coming from the studio business, we know that um, what, what an m and con- contractor may consider quiet, we would consider to be a howling gale. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we have all we have all the experience. We're like we we can look at the system and say, okay, give us the give us a technical blurb on the on the uh, AHU unit. Give us a technical blurb on the fan call unit. Tell us what what length of ducting it is. Give us the diameter of the ducting. Tell us what grills are on the end of it, and we can do an assessment and we can tell you whether that will achieve spec or not. Um, or we actually take that job on ourselves and actually deal with it ourselves. Okay. Now 
you talked about how it's possible to take some of this with you. So yeah. what is a deconstruction like and then a reconstruction? Okay. Essentially speaking, a deconstruction would, would uh, the, the, it's all finished. When, when, when the room is, 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 when the shell's completed, it's all then um, lined with the fabric. So the fabric is on a tracking system. So that just is, is extracted off, uh, just, you just, you just pull that off as such. Beyond that, then your tracking, your probably your tracks are not really going to be useful because they're going to be spanning across modules. But your modules are fully demountable. The face panel, the sound insulation within the module, and um, and the actual c- components that, that you're going to make up the module. So all the wall modules are deconstructible. The ceiling is deconstructible as well too. The floor probably not because it's it's you. you I think you may well be able to take away the isolating rubbers as far as it goes, but. Uh, it's built up of horizontal sheets of gypsum board, and they don't tend to be good at, you know, deconstructing as far as it goes. Right. So therefore, probably the floor, but the doors will be removable, the windows will be removable, all of those components. What we would say to a client is, look, somewhere between between 25 and 35% of your investment would be retained. Okay. So for example, if you spent 100,000 euros on the studio, we'd be saying to you, 35,000 euros of that will be the, the, the kind of the economic figure in terms of what is what you're able to, you know, by the time you deconstruct, remove and then reconstruct, you probably at that kind of a rate as such, you know? I see. See, I would have thought it would be higher somehow since all the components are there. Yeah, again, there's a labor component, which is, yes, huh. it, it, it there's a labor component, which is specific to the job on the day. Sure. Got it. Okay. So let's talk about cost. Okay. So we've got an actual, um, we've got two ways for people to, to get an, an idea on the cost of a studio. Again, we, we really w- want to furnish this information to people uh, and not have them, like the traditional way of, of working at a cost is you get your architect, he gets an acoustic consultant, he gets an M&E guy, he gets uh, uh, a quantity surveyor. They come up with a plan to and fro, and that takes its own sweet time and has its own cost associated with it. Eventually, you get to the point whereby they've got, they've agreed on a schedule of what they want to do. They then go to the market and they have X number of contractors bid for it. And, you know, that's the, that's the way that works. But straight away, you're actually into a very extended period of time. And you're also at a point in time where you've got costs, which may you're unaware of what the actual scale in them are. The beauty of Smart Studio is it's built on modules. I know what a module costs. And I just do X modules by Y modules. And I can actually very, very quickly uh, return an accurate cost. Uh, now, it'll be in a, a band. We're not going to give somebody an exact price because we need to see the site in advance to, to get it. You know, if, the, if, if it's in a warehouse and we can drive our truck in and we can take the material off and it's right there beside us, that means... Um, a less expensive job. If it's on the seventh floor of the White Tower and we gotta we gotta bring the stuff into the basement and we gotta get up on the lift and we gotta you know, there are issues like that that we need to which are site specific and there's also issues around the air conditioning which are site specific as such. Yeah. But we do give a band price between X and Y. Uh, so therefore you, you get some idea of where it's at. So on our Smart Studio Inc. website, you have the opportunity to, to, to give pass on some of your details to us and then you can step in. And what we did there was Rather than let people, rather than say, okay, X meters by Y meters or X foot by Y foot, because a lot of people you're dealing with, they're not that, um, they're not that sort of, it's not their normal uh, disposition to be talking in feet. So what we, we say, on-air studio, three people. We say TV production studio, X people. We say uh, medium-sized dubbing suite, uh, you know. So therefore, they can see, they can actually just pick what they think they need. as a, And then, you know, okay, there will be a physical size associated with that. Then they will see a band price from X to Y as a guide price. Now we've also uh, now that really does help make the decision making chain along because now if you're looking at a possible project you 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 can go to your local equipment supplier give him a schedule of equipment he'll tell you it can cost X you know to to supply that equipment you can go to your local system integrator and say I want to put all this gear into that room there how much will that cost now you got that figure and now you've got a figure for your studio so you've got a budgetary figure to tell you whether this actually is a runner or or not. Yeah, yeah. As such, you know, uh, and then beyond that, then we have another spreadsheet which we then share with people when if when uh, and it's kind of it gives us all the range of, of, of room sizes. So this is all down to you know uh, dimensions as far as it goes, and that not alone gives you the internal dimension of the room; it gives you the actual 
size of the footprint of the smart studio, which is basically 10 inches deeper than the internals. So if you said to me that, that it's it's actually the room is five is is 10 foot wide, I'd say well actually the room is 10 foot wide, but the floor print of it is 10 foot plus 20 inches because we got two walls either end of it. Sure. And then what we do also do is we then give them a, a, another column which says this is the ideal site size. So to get a room of this size, you should be looking for a site of that size. Again, very useful information when you're going looking for a new premises for a new building. You can be quite specific with your with your uh, uh, real estate boys and say, look, at this is what we're looking for. That's the size of there. Um, and, and it, you know, that's the, it, again, it just shortens the whole decision making chain. It just means the thing runs a lot smoother as such, you know. Sure. Jim, I saw that there was a speaker calibration component yep. in this as well. So can you describe that? Indeed. Again, the speaker calibration component is actually a very light touch because thankfully the rooms are so good acoustically speaking, you're not going to have to find yourself trying to sort of deal with all sorts of, you know, resonances and sounds in a room as such. So the speaker calibration is very much geared up for, for, the, for the boys in 5.1 and Dolby and what have you. Um, and you want to... Uh, Anywhere in any room, no matter who builds it or who designs it, there's only it can only the speed sound can only up be optimized for one particular position or one particular zone, and that's obviously where the guy is sitting with his fingers on the, you know on the on the mixing desk uh, with the faders. So uh, it's also not always possible to put the five point one the back speakers etc the rear speakers and and the subs where you want to put them. They have to go for lots of reasons where they have to go. So you need to ensure that we can calibrate for that mixed position, that the guy sitting at that, or the girl sitting at that desk, at that, at that mixed position, knows that what they're hearing is 100% accurate as such. So therefore, that's part of what we do. Now, again, it's, it's when I go back to my early days back in Wimble Lane Studios, and we were using the white equalizers yeah. to try and tune. And our, the game was get the uh, Clark Technic screen to be flat yeah. in our wonderful innocence. And we'd spend all day and tweaking it, and eventually we'd get a flat, and it would sound terrible. Yep, yep. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. But we're now in a much more uh, advanced technological world whereby we've got some fantastic D DSP units, all at very, very relatively affordable costs. And I suppose like everything in life, these are all tools, and we only see them as, we see them as part of our toolbox. We don't see them as the solution. They are part of our toolbox. We got it, we got our, um, Passive toolboxes, which are smart studio. We got our, uh, and then we got our active tools, which is our, which is our um, mostly timing alignment as far as it goes. We we really don't get down and dirty on trying to, you know, trying to uh, put any curves in on the speakers. We let the speakers speak for themselves. But you know, there are whereas years ago those tools were were very expensive and and really didn't do what we thought they should do. Nowadays, there are tools, and um, so we, we enjoy using the, all of those components um, to, 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 to ensure we get a calibrated mixing environment or a calibrated listing environment that is consistent room to room. You know, again, in the world of acoustics, calibration is a very important phrase. We have to calibrate the meters every once every two years. We've got to calibrate them when we go to site with our, 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 our field sound calibrator. So... You know, we come from that engineering discipline of wanting calibration and accuracy. Sure, sure. It sounds like you're just concentrating on the UK for now, but obviously if this is modular, then it's also scalable to other countries. Any plans on on that? Yeah, we, we, we do indeed. Yeah, we have, we have very much um, plans in that area. Now, again, what we're very much doing at the moment is, is uh, okay, our target market is our home market here in Ireland, which has been surprisingly good to us, which I didn't think it would be, because uh, we didn't, it's this very small market. The UK is definitely buying into what we're doing. And then Europe is also, we've got some very interesting contacts from Europe, and, I, you know, and we can look after the, uh, that sort of range of countries from our own little base here in Dublin. Beyond that, then, yeah, we are, we're actively looking at finding partners. We really need to find, we need to find probably, the question is, are they audio partners or are they construction partners, you know, because they kind of need to be a bit of a, a bit of both. They need to be a bit of a hybrid because that's what we are here. We're a bit of a hybrid company, you know. We got construction experience, we got acoustics experience, we got electrical experience, we got uh, the uh, you know we, we, we all the guys who work with me have have trained the sound engineers, so we got that technical skill. And um, 
and you know we're all quite conversant on equipment and what have you so we certainly do see a wonderful opportunity to 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 bring this to you know lots of and i mean the american marketplace is the obvious one obviously uh, you're in california i'm in los angeles yes I mean, look at you know. As I tell, as I, as I often say to the boys here, I said, you know, we, we're we're just we're just, the only problem with smart students we're in the wrong country in the world as such. You know, <laughs> I'll tell you where I'm at. I'm in Burbank. I can walk to NBC, ABC Television, Disney, Universal, and Warner Brothers and DreamWorks. They're in my neighborhood, and a host, dozens, dozens of post houses are in my neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's our market. I mean, Bobby, yeah. that's exactly our marketplace, you know. And um, so, but we got to be realistic too. We, you know, we we can't afford. We we can't afford. I, I don't even mean from a, from a financial point of view, but we can't afford to, not to run out uh, and offer something and then fail to deliver as such, you know. Sure. So, um, but that's a process that we're working on. Um, and um, you know, we've we've had some interesting contacts from people in in your part of the world there. Who, who 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 have the construction expertise and have the construction abilities and what have you and have a degree of experience in the studio marketplace um so we're, we're, we're discussing slowly but surely discussing uh, um tactics with them but it, it certainly is on our radar to 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 um you know like we spend a long time divining this I think this this particular smart studio it, it, it's it's a child of the recession um, that kicked in in Ireland back 2008 2010 uh, because we had a lot of time on our hands and we are our traditional construction industry people just simply fell off their perch they were gone and so we had to turn our attention to uh, what I didn't think we would have any uh, ever work back in again. I, I didn't think I'd ever work back in the studio business again. But I turned my attention to that, and and here you go. So um, it it's been a long time coming. It's 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 we're we're actually working on patenting the system in the U. In we have a patent in the UK and in Europe, and we're looking on one, one in the states. And we kind of got to let those things run their course. And then beyond that point in time, then um, yeah, I mean, look at. We certainly would hope and expect to be active in the LA market, in the in the in you know the, that California market, you know, within the next two to three years for sure. Yeah, well, it's a great idea. I must admit, I was intrigued when I heard about it. When I looked at your website and the the animation that you have, which is fantastic, which shows everything, and then I read through all the material and I thought, wow, th this is really it's smart studio. It really yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, that, that's it's kind of yeah, it is. It, it is. It is at the end of the day. And it, it's it's um, it's as I said, it's something to a lot of hours and what have you. But, you know, it's all based on the getting, you know, the pure fundamentals. You're going to get uh, philosophy is, is get control of the low frequency spectrum. And if you get control of the low frequency spectrum, then you don't have the harmonics sort of spewing out further up on the spectrum, and then you're finding a problem at, at 1K. But, you know, 1K is not probably the problem. It's 500, it's 250. It's probably 125 is where the problem is, as mm -hmm. such, you know. And that's what we find. When we actually get control of the low-frequency spectrum, um, it works, you know. It really does work, as such, you know. Um, yeah, fundamentals, always the fundamentals. Last question, Jim. What's the best piece of business advice that maybe you learned along the way or someone imparted to you? Okay, I suppose the best bit of business advice, and uh, you know, is I certainly found that taking control of the situation, like buying a CNC machine, you know, taking control of the situation. Um, obviously, you need partners, you need other people around you and what have you, but I found that, um, you know, Conceiving, you know, you got to have a something that's a little bit left to center, a little, so a little bit different. You know, me too. Companies always will survive, but always struggle. You got to find a, a slightly different angle. It's probably on the same team, you know, but it, it's it's or a known team. But find a slightly different angle. Um, you then got to commit to sort of researching that inside and out. And I think you got to commit to taking as much control of that as you possibly can. That means you got to have a small, uh, um, multi-dimensional team who can work, who can sort of understand where you want to go and who can work with you as such. And then be prepared to 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 for for lots of be prepared for lots of um, surprises. Uh, some of them nice, some of them not so nice. 
um, and be prepared to put some money behind it and sort of say, look at, you know, we've, we've, we've just got to do this. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's, the, life is full of lots of learning opportunities, um, lots of experiences, some of them pleasant, some of them not so, but they all, we all build up for, uh, 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 you know, once you're on the right path, they all build to something very, very uh, satisfying and, and worthwhile in the end. You can find out more about Jim and Smart Studio at smartstudioinc.com. That's smartstudioinc, all one word, dot com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyowinnercircle.com, or you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, and now Radio Public. At BobbyOsinski.com and BobbyOwnerCircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. Music.